looks like we're approaching the hour, so I'll give everybody a, another minute or so and we'll get started. Great, let's do it. Good morning, everybody. If you want to say hi in the chat box, we are live in the chat box. Checking in, how's your morning? Martin Chang, hope you're well. Viviana, hope you're well. Hey, Martin. Good morning. Viviana, ooh. Uh, Chieme, Chieme. Viviana, I'm gonna learn to say your name. I would say Chieme. But what do I know? Great. Oh. Let's go ahead and get started. Peace, Charles. So Hello and welcome to the Effie Berry Training Institute's webinar entitled Motivational Interviewing, New Tools for HIV Prevention and Care. Um, we're joined by Jim Sacco. Um, Jim is a consultant and trainer based in Asheville, North Carolina. Jim's clinical experience in HIV dates to 1984 and includes practice in medical, substance use, um, and community settings. Since 1989, Jim provided training in a wide range of academic, governmental, and community-based organizations. Um, Jim has trained more than 50,000 healthcare workers. So thank you, Jim, for being with us. Um, I'm Elena Perry. I'm a program coordinator with Health HIV, and we are the Effie Berry Training Institute. Um, this program is funded wholly or in part by the government of the District of Columbia, DC Health, HIV AIDS, Hepatitis, STD, TV Administration, or HOSPA. <laughs> um, the Effie Berry Training Institute um, is a uh, DC funded initiative that provides trainings and technical assistance to support current and prospective HOSTA grantees and community based organizations in an array of services, including fee for service business process, um, advanced skills in healthcare systems, data and health informatics, and more. Um, you can access our website, Effie Berry Training Institute, EffieBerryInstitute.org. Um, to request TA, um, access old trainings, resources, um, and upcoming uh, self-paced uh, provider modules. Um, just as a note and a reminder before I pass the torch to Jim, um, you can receive continuing education credits for this activity depending on your credential. Um, and I sent you all a handout, um, all registrants a handout ahead of this meeting, but if you haven't received it, you can email me, Elena, E-L-A-I-N-A, at healthhiv.org, and we'll have a slide at the end with the CME eval information as well. So Jim, take it over when you're ready. I'm ready, good morning everybody. Thank you for making time today. My name is Jim Sacco. I'm a clinical social worker, uh, as Elena said, based in Asheville, North Carolina. I have been involved, golly, I've been involved in HIV work for uh, more than 30 years now. I was a volunteer buddy. Uh, I was a social work student in 1986. Anyway, I have earned this bald head, that's for sure. So we talk about today, um, we're gonna give you a flavor of MI. We've just got an hour and, and what I'd said to Elaine and the health HIV people when we started is, what I wish we could do is lock you in a room for a couple of days and really learn motivational interviewing. And, and this is a first conversation for those of you who are interested. Um, so uh, just to give it some context, today we're gonna spend an hour just getting a flavor of what motivational interviewing is, although I'm pretty sure for many of you, you've had some previous exposure. My hunch is uh, that you, in school or in other trainings, you've you've had some some flavor of it. So today, what we want to do is kind of just give you a teaser review for those of you who've had some experience, um, and, and then also this is a preview for people who want to sign on to a follow-up training series. I'll go ahead and do the commercial right now. Following this meeting, um, sometime starting in August, I guess, we've got a series of four skill building uh, meetings. We really expect people um, to, to make the commitment to all four. It's two hours, four sessions. And so it's a, a pretty intensive training, all, all on Zoom, but we want you to practice. You'll actually go into small groups, do some skill building, and then um, uh, in between the sessions, the reason we do them two weeks apart is we're gonna give you kind of a flavor of MI skills and have you go back to your practice setting and sort of focus on that particular subset of skills. So not required, we'd love for any of you who wanna be part of this skill building to join that and 
not a requirement. It's it's you'll get more information about that later. But that's uh, what we're doing here is is giving you a teaser, uh, giving you a reminder. Go in the chat box. Um, anybody who would, I've had yes or no. I've had previous six or just those of you who have had previous exposure. Go in the chat box. Uh, type all participants and uh, yes, yes. If you've had previous exposure, I'm just trying to see. There's somebody. If you've had previous exposure in school or workshops, okay, got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. There they go. Okay, boom, 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 boom. Martin, I know you did. Okay, Ms. Brinkley, thank you. Joe, you got it. All right, all right. Yeah, I, like I said, I figured it, it's been around. It's been if you if you've done any substance use work, it's been in the SAMHSA literature 25 years now. Uh, some of our uh, uh, HIV evidence-based interventions have MI as the framework. Certainly any good case management, I think, or, or intensive prevention efforts have MI at the heart of it. So uh, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to give you a little background on how we got here. This is uh, decidedly a bit more academic than what I usually do, but there's always somebody, all right, semester, a whole semester in master's degree, man, that you ought to teach the class. Whoever's doing that, that's uh, that's an excellent, yeah, again, younger people, have, have really been exposed usually in nurses or or uh, social work training. Thank you, Meredith, I see your answer also. So, uh, but just a review for those of us, what it is, where it comes from. It's a little more academic, as I said, than what I normally do, but there's always somebody who says, well, what is this mumbo jumbo and do I wanna be part of it? So we really want it today to be a chance to kind of understand where it comes from. And then again, we'll, for those of you who wanna be part of the, the ongoing training, we'll have a chance to, to talk about that later. So um, let me go ahead. Alina, do I have control of the? Um, you should be able to click new screen share. Oh, okay. Sorry, everybody. Got it. So here's how we got here. I said we'd start with relevant background. Um, so so I, I guess I should say um, I was lucky enough to train with Dr. Miller and Rolnick as a and my trainer in 2004. I was doing a HIV research project and the people that I worked for said we want you to be trained in MI training and and dumb luck. They, they paid so for free. I got to go. It was the last year that Dr. Miller and Rolnick did that training every year. Uh, the MI operation trains new trainers. I just happened to be there the last year that Dr. Miller and Rolna did this three-day training of trainers. So that's where I came from. So I'm going to tell some stories. It's not like it's not like they're my personal friends. I just was in this training. I've done some follow-up training with Dr. Miller, and, and I track both of them on a, a listserv for MI trainers. So Dr. Miller talks about the grounding of this in humanistic psychology. If you think about client-centered counseling, uh, person-centered counseling, Carl Rogers, uh, Rollo May, eventually Virginia Satir spins off family therapy from that. But the whole idea of humanistic uh, client-centered counseling, kind of uh, uh, un unconditional positive regard for everybody, empathy, believe, believing in the patient's worth, and that people solve their own problems. At the heart of client-centered counseling is this idea of people have the answers to their own problems. So, so all that is the, the grounding, that's Dr. Miller's early training as a psychologist. And then uh, what's also critical to understanding how we got here is Dr. Miller was, uh, was and is uh, an expert in the field of substance use. He was frontline substance use treatment disorder, substance use disorder treatment guy. And really what, what struck me about this as I listened to him tell the story is in many ways this is a reaction to uh, traditional uh, drug and alcohol treatment. I, I, I doubt that many of you are old enough to remember. I remember old school drug and alcohol treatment where you you put a person in the hot seat and told them how terrible they were and people screaming at them. And the, the whole idea was, was changes imposed by uh, uh, telling uh, Elena, if you could handle the password question in the chat box, I'm not sure what the password is. Um, telling people how bad they were and breaking down their denial. And, and Dr. Miller, as he recounts, it was just like, you know, there must be 
uh, another way. The other thing I think that's critical to this is, is Dr. Miller uh, and, and Rolnick sort of, sort of believe in a trauma-informed approach, the, the idea that so many people have a vulnerability that they bring to this. So, so again, start to talk about a, a theory that emerges in the early mid 80s called motivational interviewing. Dr. Bill Miller starts it, you'll see in a minute, he meets Dr. Rolnick and they pull together to write the first book. But uh, what, what Im impressed Dr. Miller early on was that there, there are studies that suggest that in substance use treatment, uh, the empathy of the therapist, and, and there, there are a number of hard studies that research that recognize how empathic the therapist is and look at patient outcomes. And what they found is patients who do better had counselors with higher levels of empathy. And so this set him thinking about the role of empathy, again, rather than breaking through denial and telling people how terrible they were. Uh, what's also critical from the very beginning of uh, MI is, is that ambivalence about change is normal. Um, the idea here is that, that you know, all of us want to be skinny and sexy and, and healthy, but do we want to do all the things we need to do to get to skinny, sexy, and healthy? I know myself, every morning I say, this will be the day I start down a skinny, sexy, healthy road, and I usually make it till about 10 or 11 when I'm off the wagon and whatever else. So, so the idea here is that ambivalence isn't bad, or the other term that Dr. Miller really hates is people are in denial about whatever their situation is. I mean, people know there's risk. Most people understand the risk of HIV and STIs. People know that hepatitis is a risk if they're sharing injection drug. You know, it's like, they're not in denial. There's a much more complicated human nature. So uh, also critical to MI is sort of meeting people where they're at. A lot of times when I say to people, what do you remember from your first class? The one thing that people take away is, well, we need to be where people are, not where they should be. And I'm like, well, you did pretty good in that first exposure because if you start there, understanding readiness, uh, you're gonna do great. Uh, uh, using a directive style, that if I tell you what you got to do, people are likely to react against that. And so uh, as we get further in this conversation, particularly those of you in the, the later workshops, uh, if I say you have to stop drinking, I'm gonna give you two reasons why I'm not really an alcoholic and your scale is wrong. And, and you get in that tug of war, I know, we're in that tug of war all the time. So uh, instead of telling you what you got to do and telling you you're an alcoholic or you're fat or you're too sexually active or you're very high risk for HIV or whatever, um, I, I am curious, the, the suggestion here is a curious guiding style in which I ask you to help me understand your perception of your HIV risk and use my relationship and clinical skills to help bid, build readiness. That's that's the heart of this thing. So uh, the, the timeline, just sort of how we got here, Dr. Miller publishes a paper in 1983, um, I want to say American psychologist, but uh, use of, I think he, he used the term motivational interviewing in substance abuse treatment, I think is the title. I can, I can look up, I apologize. Um, but, but, but Miller's, oh, there's a citation there. You'll see it in a minute, sorry. Um, Miller's first paper, 1983. What he said is he wrote the paper uh, he, I heard him tell this story. It was great. He wrote the paper. He didn't know that anybody read it. This is a quote. He said he didn't think anybody read it. While in the UK, at the same time, Dr. Stephen Rolnick, also a psychologist, but working in, in chronic disease, hospital-based uh, diabetes prevention, COPD treatment, but, but a psychologist, uh, had read the paper and thought it was great. And so some random thing, I think they were in the same hospital or in the same meeting, they kind of randomly met, and uh, uh, the, the, the story goes that, that uh, Miller said, I'm Bill Miller, and Rolnick said, uh, you wrote the greatest paper, that was so smart. They started talking uh, on Miller's sabbatical in the UK, and, and the evolution became motivational interviewing. So, so from this original paper exploring the idea, again, Dr. Bill Miller and Stephen Rolnick came together. The first edition book there, 1981, uh, you know, 2,000 uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications. Uh, the the I, I guess what I want to say is th there, there are people that get a little kooky about MI, like it's the only way to do business. And I did full disclosure, there are amazing success stories. And it, again, it's been an evidence-based intervention for 25 years, healthcare, corrections, uh, family planning, uh, youth, uh, correctional 
probation officers love MI working with, with probationees. But um, what, I, what I always qualify is this is not a method to get 100% of people to uh, abstain from sex or, or drugs or 100% of people to do the right thing. The research studies found that this group got an MI intervention and this group got good health education or a traditional approach. And this group had better medication adherence or better condom use or whatever else, a percent of these people. So um, it, it, it's important, I think, to qualify. Like I said, you probably have met people who, who just are on fire for motivational interviewing. I think it's an extraordinary tool to help people change their behavior. I also think just full disclosure, uh, I'm not a, a missionary out to convert you. I really I want to challenge people to try it. Those of you who've had previous exposure, I want you to dust off your old workbook and, and see if there's some tools you want to use. Uh, and, and again, it's not a tool that's going to work for everybody. There, there are some people who are not going to change their behavior. Uh, but compared to sort of standard of care, uh, lots of research that says MI is more effective at, at helping people make a change in their health behavior, including sexual health. So um, a, a quote from, from uh, Dr. Miller in the, the uh, first edition book, uh, one of the things that, that uh, is central to MI is that our work as uh, helpers, counselors, therapists, nurses, social workers, um, affects change. And, and, and at the heart of this thing, motivation is not, people come in at a certain level of motivation, but what he emphasized from the very beginning is that motivation is impacted by our relationship as helpers. And part of why I took to motivational interviewing when I first was exposed, again, I was exposed probably five or six years at least before I was formally trained, is because I do think that the helping relationship is essential to people getting better. That, that my own experience, you know, a, a good nurse or healthcare worker or a therapist that I've seen that helping relationship helps me be more motivated. And so that's at the heart of this thing. And uh, the, the last quote here from the, the uh, MI in Healthcare book that Dr. Millen Ron Rolnick put together in 2001, a conversation in which people talk themselves into change. Uh, and, and so again, uh, sometimes people say, oh, this thing is manipulative or whatever else. It, we have an agenda, everybody on this call, I think, your boss is telling you to get people to stop using, stop shooting, stop having sex, get on prep, whatever the target behavior is. But this is a collaborative way of uh, building readiness. Again, having people talk themselves into it. I always put this caution out. I, I, I tell a story. I was somewhere down in, I, I, was North, I think it was Charlotte. I was down in Charlotte, North Carolina. They're doing this great workshop. I thought I was, you know, being cute and and smart and uh uh. This participant says, you a manipulator, like calls me out in the middle of class. I was like, okay, we're gonna we have to break that down a little bit. Because what I was talking about is using our relationship and our clinical skills to help people make healthy choices. Um, I prefer to not think of MI as a manipulative thing, but uh, it is a way to build motivation for people to be healthier. And you know, I think what I said to her is that at the end of the day, if I was selling used cars, or insurance, I might feel guilty, but this was a case management training for you know public health. I said, well, we're trying to keep people from not dying of diabetes and COPD or lung cancer, so I can sleep at night knowing that I'm being strategic about doing that. So anyway, you there there's a misuse of this, and people tend to say, oh, we're uh, there 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 are some people in the business world. Uh, this this makes the MI people crazy, but who say, well, you teach MI and you'll be better at selling furniture or, or something, realty or real estate or something. And, and the MI, hardcore MI people just freak out at the idea that people are using this. So anyway, it's a way of being strategic, using your relationship and the strategic skills to get people to stay healthier. That's it. Um, I'm going to do a quick poll. Elena, if you'll help me out, I want you to think about a change you've made in your own health habits. So some of you have been former smokers or or stop drinking, or, or eat healthy, or, or exercise. I want you to think about a lasting change that you've made. Okay, so think about a change in your health habits that you've made, that, that you've stuck with. And yes or no, this happened because somebody told me I had to change. Doctor said, you're fat, lose weight. You're a smoker, you gotta stop. Just no right or wrong answer. Uh, 
go ahead and look at the radial buttons, click the radial button that most closely matches your reason for lasting change. Was it somebody told you you had to, or was it other reasons? Another 15 seconds or so. Your lasting change, what was behind your lasting change? Lane a five second warning and let's publish the results. Four, three, two, one. Let's do it. Let's see. Your lasting change. Okay. That's about right. That's exactly what I would have expected. Excellent. About a quarter of us, somebody said, You're fat. You got to lose that weight. A uh, quarter of us, somebody said, Your boyfriend's a bum. You better divorce him. Something, right? Another 75% of us said, well, they told me, but I changed because something else. And, and again, I, I'm, when we look at smoking cessation studies, uh, about a quarter of people, especially a healthcare worker, my doctor tells people what they got to do. About a quarter of people are going to go off and do what the doctor says. I just get another doctor or I go do whatever I want and come back to the doctor and lie about, oh yeah, I, uh, uh, oh, I've, I, I've been eating a 1200 calorie diet. I don't know what happened. Must be my metabolism, something, right? Um, so uh, again, for those of you who did change because of a directive approach, that's great. Uh, I think most people in this case, three quarters of us didn't change when someone told us what to do. And so again, the way MI fits in to your bag of tricks is this is a set of tools for people for whom a directive approach, you're at high risk for HIV, here's a condom or here's some prep, now go do it, is not an effective intervention. And so uh, again, if that works, and, and again, a directive approach for 25% of us, probably about statistical average, that means you got three quarters of your patients who need you to work differently. And so the reason we're here is I think our patient population is pretty similar to us, which is most of us don't need somebody telling us what, what we need to do. And in fact, I'm that guy, I'm that bad patient. I'm gonna go ahead, your teacher is a bad patient. I'm that guy who says, nah, I don't need to do that thing. Or what do you know? Like you said, I'll either fire the doctor or lie to the doctor, that's, that's my story. So your teacher is a bad patient, there you have it. Um, so uh, back to the, the role of humanistic psychology, Blaise Pascal is an old school uh, uh, researcher uh, in, in uh, eventually became a researcher in adult learning theory, I think is trained as a psychologist, but, but people persuaded by their own arguments. And again, at the heart of this thing, uh, I'm going to change when I figure out the reason I need to change. For those of you who said false, I didn't change. Uh, because my doctor, someone told me I had to. I think for most of us, we changed when we were ready. Uh, that that for me, when I think about lasting change, I'm a former smoker. I just had a, a long time ago, but I just had enough. I just was D-O-N-E. And I knew, you know, it's like, I knew about smoking was bad for me and people had wagged their finger. I promise people had wagged their finger at me for years. At some point, I hit a bottom. Uh, those of you in recovery know what I'm talking about. You hit a bottom. You said, I'm tired of waking up here, out here in Maryland, not sure how I got here, where my purse is, uh, where where my something is, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shape up, right? So uh, why it works, you know, this is, this is again, uh, the people that, that study MI don't, don't just sort of do those research uh, findings, but the people, uh, Dr. Miller's at the University of New Mexico, and there's an enormous research operation at the University of New Mexico, where um, Dr. Miller and his colleagues kind of dig into tapes and client records uh, with the idea of, of trying to figure out what works about MI. And, and so some of the things they found is that um, uh, the idea of giving people hope and supporting self-efficacy, let me stop with that. Self-efficacy means that inner voice that says, can I or can't I do that thing? And, and people with high levels of self-efficacy say, yeah, I can lose this weight. Yeah, I can start um, uh, injecting more safely. I can, I can use condoms or, or yeah, I can be a prep, uh, prep user, consistent prep user. Um, and, 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 and people with poor self-efficacy are the people that look at you like you're crazy when you say, here's a female condom, now go use it every time. 
and they look at you like you must be crazy or whatever the behavior we're telling people to do and their face says i can't do that thing that you think i should do and then again active engagement the the, the relational uh you'll, you'll see in our definition in a minute the lovely way dr miller talks about the relational aspect so um am i maybe uh, uh helpful because we can be the good cop one of the things i say to people that work in medical settings if you're cleaning up for a doctor a resident a bossy nurse practitioner and you get to be the social worker the case manager that comes behind that uh and they've been told by miss bossy pants nurse practitioner you better take your medicine you're a bad patient what kind of whatever and then and so they got all that junk from nurse bossy pants and you come in and talk about well what do you think about it and wow that's a drag that somebody was disrespectful to you well let's unpack what treatment would look like so um if people have had a bad cop experience it it is they may see am i as a relief or a different way and again who doesn't want to feel validated and have somebody see me as smart and capable right um the other important thing and i i don't know every everything about your patient population i know about the district of columbia and this last bullet feels poor important as they do these meta-analysis studies on who am i works for and whatever else um there were even bigger effects for people of color, racial, ethnic minorities, African Americans, Latinx persons, than uh, European Americans. And, and so as you're thinking about how does this relate to my client base, again, the research meta-analysis studies uh, say that not only does it work, again, not for everybody, for a percent of people, uh, but even a, a more significant effect for people of color than European Americans. So uh, again, knowing the district, I, I am assuming most of you work with a significant population that is people of color, some of you probably exclusively in the District of Columbia. Um, so uh, again, to full disclosure about these research findings, uh, small to medium effect sizes. That means we didn't, nobody stopped smoking forever. Nobody, not everybody did it, but small to medium effect. I use condoms more often than the control group. I was better adherent to my medication than the control group. That's what, what it means. Better results with treatment manuals and, and sort of ongoing coaching. I'm kind of making the argument here for training and coaching. Um, but therapist attributes are key. Again, that, that whole idea that more empathic uh, therapists indicate better results. The, the gold standard of MI that we will not get to in this training series, but just for those of you who are overambitious, I'm, I'm gonna be the star, the rock star of this thing. And taping your sessions, having a trained coder code the MI and giving you feedback uh, uh, impact the quality of MI. So in a research finding, uh, people are working often from training manuals that give conversation prompts and, and but then in research settings, those are taped tapes are scored. That's what coding means. There's actually a scoring guide that, that professional coders use. And then that feedbacks into a quality improvement. Uh, that that Im impacts the quality uh, of the MI. Again, back to the idea of the characteristics of the therapist. Uh, you'll see in just a minute, uh, unconditional positive regard, allowing autonomy, allowing me to tell you what I think about. Those are all at the heart of the thing. And then finally, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but empathy as the most important thing back from the early research on MI. Let me catch my breath. Any questions so far? I'm looking at the chat box. Any questions so far uh, about anything I've done? Any comment? Uh, uh, I'm not, Lena, I'm not looking at the q and I'm just in the chat box. So if there's something going on in the Q&A, you can tell me that. Any questions or comment? I know I'm going quick, full disclosure, this is a 90 minute talk that I'm doing in 60 minutes. So I did have a bunch of strong coffee, but I'm also trying to get a 90 minute talk into 60 minutes. I'll keep half an eye on the chat box. If you do think of something and we'll stop again at the end, but please, if you've got a comment, uh, thank you. Somebody said so far, so good. I'm doing the best I can. Um, if you have a comment or a question, please let me know. So relevant study, again, back to the background of study on diabetes uh, management. Uh, uh, again, I, I talked about empathy as a substance use treatment uh, variable. People did better in substance use treatment. Here's a, I think, uh, 
June 3rd, I think it was published in 14, but, but another study that, that's often cited um, uh, about a thousand diabetic patients looking at diabetic outcomes, uh, the physicians that high, had higher empathy uh, had patients with better A1C and other diabetes measures. So, so again, the idea in other settings, oh, I stopped too soon. Uh, 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 the other settings is whatever. So again, uh, the chat box is open. I'm gonna, gonna keep rolling. Excellent. So um, why, why training? And again, this is not just to sell you on the future training. There are lots of training opportunities. So this opportunity through Effie Berry is gonna be available to some of you, but if this is something you wanna uh, get better at or get back to sort of why, uh, you know, people say, well, can't, you know, I work in so many places where uh, they say, oh, can't you train my people in one, you know, hour long webinar and they'll be, skilled in MI and and I you know the the argument is that you know kind of baseline training needs to be eight to twelve hours like like in MI they say just just practicing the basics partly because breaking old habits giving advice and telling people what to do the traditional confrontational approach it, it takes time and practice to break that I think for most of us particularly nurses and physicians. I love you nurses, I love you physicians, and the, the whole sort of diagnose and prescribe, you're fat, here's a 1200 calorie diet, you're at risk for hepatitis by injecting, so stop injecting, you know, whatever. Um, the, the educating and a directive approach for some of us tend to be part of our nature. And again, what you saw in your early poll for three quarters of you, that didn't work, that sort of you are, fat, stop doing that thing, you are, you are, uh, too, drink too much, whatever else. Um, the other important finding and the reason for training is the issue of MI language. Um, one of the things that, that is important to train yourself is to listen for uh, client language that speaks in favor of change. Um, the, the, I, I went to a intermediate level training, uh, Dr. Miller and Terry Moyers at, at, in New Mexico some time ago, but but she's a researcher who's just really an egghead researcher and uh, no offense if, if she's your cousin, but you know what I mean, like hardcore. She's down in a basement of, a, of an academic building doing the research and she comes out of there and says, the most important thing is this issue of client language, the ability to evoke change talk. Um, that what they've done is they listen to tapes over time. And as people start to say, well, maybe I should uh, uh, start using condoms or, you know, I heard about PrEP, maybe it's something I should consider, or I'm gonna get on PrEP, or I picked up some condoms at the club last weekend or whatever, that as more change talk emerges in the client interview, the more likely it is that patient's gonna change. It, you know, it's, it's research finding, it's just common sense. When you're sitting with a, a consumer, don't you just feel when they move from, I don't need that, this is stupid, why are you making me stay here, to, well, you said something last week about condoms, or you said something about a once a day medication I could take, or you said someplace had free needles in town, right? And so people just seem less resistant. People, you know, and, and, and so again, change talk as the precursor. What's important about that is that that's the most important variable in terms of, of uh, predicting a client change, then the implications for you are you better get better at getting change talk. And for me as a trainer, I better teach you how to get change talk. And so uh, uh, again, for those of you who've had some previous exposure, I just have you to dust off the idea of where change talk comes from, how to get change talk. And the opposite of that is sustained talk, reasons why I don't need to, I can't change, don't want to change. Um, I, I call it the cat and the fuzzy mouse. You're throwing suggestions and people are batting it back like a cat, you know, cat in the fuzzy mouth, you know, I, I got condoms. No, my boyfriend's too big for that. I, I got needles. No, I ain't going to no need. I got AA meetings. I ain't going to no churchy something, right? And you're there tossing suggestions. Um, the hallmark is I'm telling you, I'm not ready, willing, and able. And so if you hear in sustained talk, stop throwing the fuzzy mouth. It's a clue to you to work differently. And, and I suggest you look at the definition of MI. So there's your definition from the uh, uh, 
2012 third edition book. I should say, uh, if you're interested in more about MI, you want to get a book, the third edition book, um, so they, they've revised the book twice from the, the initial. The third edition has six, they're all 90% the same, but the third edition book has some significant changes, particularly because of um, research findings, sort of how to do MI based on what they've learned in 25 years of practice. So there's your definition. I, I guess I wanna invite people who are willing, look at that definition. And if you would in the chat box, is there a word or phrase that speaks to the needs of your most vulnerable consumers? What I'm thinking about is somebody who knows they're supposed to change. They've been in with STDs, so they've had abscesses, other medical stuff with their injecting. Somebody who knows they need to change and has the facts, taken risk, but cannot seem to do it consistently. That's when I think about vulnerable consumers. So look at that definition. Is there a word or a phrase that jumps off the screen and you say, boy, that meets the needs of my most vulnerable consumers in the chat box? Thank you. Compassion, collaborative, other words or phrases. A couple of you talking about collaborative, absolutely. You gotta get out of being the expert. It's about, we're gonna work together to help you stay healthy. Personal motivation, absolute own reason, exactly. Personal motivation. Acceptance and compassion, I said earlier something about Dr. Miller's uh, definition. The atmosphere of acceptance and compassion, thank you. Eliciting commitment, own reasons, good, person's own reasons, absolutely Effie. Person's own reason, anybody else? Yeah, that, you guys got it. That, that's really, again, the heart of this thing. And what I, what I love about this is, is it says goal-oriented, exactly. So, so the part of why this works is everybody in this gig has a, your boss is telling you what people need to do. It's a goal-oriented style. Like, like we're, part of how it differs from client-centered counseling is, uh, yeah, a couple of you, their own reasons to change. Thank you. Um, the, the, we aren't just talking about the weather or the Washington Nationals. We have an agenda. And so, again, we use our skills strategically. Say, I want to talk about your health. I want to talk about how we keep you well. I want to talk about your goal of not overdosing. Again, whatever the target behavior is, we've got a job. And so we use our skills to stay on that goal. Yeah, person-centered. This is a, a, a person-centered. It's, yeah, beautiful. Strengthening personal motivation. You guys got it. Like I said, this is a method for people who are your bad patients some ways. I'm doing air quotes with a grimace. But, you know, people that just need a pamphlet, hey, go off and shoot safely, or here's a pamphlet, go off and take your prep once a day, every day. That You don't need me to, to be here. We know what to do with those patients who, who do the right thing right away. This really is a, a, a method for people like 75% of us who heard you're supposed to do something and weren't quite ready to do it. It's a another, you're doing great. Thank you, Effie, you're doing great. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about those people who are struggling. I guess I'd like you to think about your struggle. Um, if you think about why people struggle, and if you're willing, think about a change you're supposed to make and can't do it. This is our last poll or second poll. What is it that gets in people's way of doing the healthy thing? In other words, you struggle. We're talking about you now. You're supposed to eat healthier, be an exercise or something. We've all been told, I've been told six different things I'm supposed to do. Where's your struggle? Do you need more information? Do you just not believe the consequences? Do you not believe it would be worth it? Do you lack social support, people doing the healthy thing? Do you need new skills, how to cook different, how to do something? Or is it just, I can't do it now? Take a minute, think about something. Somebody said, you've got to. X or are you internally, we know what we're supposed to do. Exercise, lose weight, eat healthier, smokers, you know that's bad for you. Another 30 seconds, Elena. Let's see, while we struggle, again, as we think about these needs of our stuck consumers. Five seconds, Elena, and then I'm gonna ask you to publish the results. And let's do it. The reasons we struggle. Need new skills. Got it? Interesting. 
Can't do it now. Ooh, that's me. I can't, I want to do it, but today's not the day. Lack of social support. Interesting. So kind of spread all over, need new skills to do it. Look at this, y'all. Look at this, y'all. The lowest, lowest on the poll is need another pamphlet. So I'm just saying, next time somebody in DC Health says, you know what, let's make more pamphlets. Let's give people more information. These people are stuck because they need the facts. You can say, well, 8% of us were stuck because we needed information. Again, your HIV patients have been in the STD clinic 100 times. They know what they're doing. Your, your, your drug using folks know that, again, every once in a while there's somebody that doesn't have the facts or, or can't act on it. Most people know what they're doing, puts them at risk, understand what they're supposed to, but like us, get stuck because they need new skills to do it. Nobody in there, everybody in their, everybody in the, their life is drinking the way they do. Or like us, they're saying, baby, I can't do it now when this COVID is over. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get right once the COVID is over. But with Miss Rona around, I can't do that healthy thing, right? All right, so interesting. Just what I hope to see for most of us, like most of our patients, lack of information is not to be, not the issue. So, um, what MI has done is it kind of builds on what we know. We've got 45 years of, of uh, study of smoking cessation, addiction, behavior change. We know a lot about behavior change, key concepts that, that you know, again, those of you who are struggling is now the time, benefits, and cost. Is it worth it? I do this, to me, it's all about a hula. It's all about sort of the cost benefit. Oh, I want to be healthy, but man, look at that. You know, I would say, uh, at a buffet restaurant. I'm that dude doing a hula when they bring out the hot mac and cheese. I'm like, dog, I don't need no mac and cheese, but look at that cheesy, greasy crust. I'm finna dive in, right? And so, so it says, is it worth it? Is the cost and benefit? I would argue that for most of us as human beings, that that sort of cost benefit is, is at the heart of our ambivalence, is at the heart of why it's hard to make a change. Uh, I, I gotta see the benefit, I gotta see the cost. It's gotta be achievable. You know, one thing I always say is, is uh, I, I've been to so many doctors who pull down that BMI chart, anybody else, and they circle that number, what BMI 24 would look like, there. There's where you need to be. And I just go, uh, yeah, that's what I weighed in fifth grade, but now I'm a grown man and I ain't ever gonna weigh 145 pounds again. 145 pounds, I'm like, uh, you could wire my jaw shut. I don't think I'm ever going to. But but when you tell me what BMI 24 looks like, that's impossible to me. In the same way that sometimes we say you need to abstain or you need to, you know, we tell kids, hopefully not in D.C., but in some of the conservative places I go, we're still doing sex ed, talking about you need to abstain because of the sanctity of marriage. And once you're 30 and the lights are out, you can have sex. Now, I want children to abstain. I promise I want children to abstain. But you're in a classroom of 16, 17 year old kids talking about all of you need to abstain till you're 30 years old. It ain't real, you know? And so it feels like we set people up sometimes, that's an example, but we set people up with goals that aren't achievable. And so the other thing about MI, I know the DC Health, because you're so savvy, is wedded to a harm reduction model. It says, let's just talk about them first five pounds. Let's just talk about using condoms with your most anonymous, most vulnerable partners, whatever else. You know, that, that in other words, um, uh, you don't have to do it perfectly. Can you cut back on, you know, the harm reduction people tell us, just cut back on, on dope, cut back on the number of needle shares. You know, we owe such a debt to Edith Springer and those early harm reduction people. I remember the first time I heard it, I've been rapping to people about, perfect condoms every time and safe needles every time and all that. And Edith Springer and that group just said, we ain't talking about every time. We talking about use needles, share needles less often or snort it or smoke it or whatever else. Just all those ideas are so aligned with human nature, uh, with, with the way I, I can't abstain from, if you tell me to abstain from a chocolate chip cookie, I'm gonna go up and make some cookies. That's where I'm at. Last reminder down there. A change as a process, not an event. Um, I, I talked earlier about ambivalence. There I am doing my hula again, competing desires. And so part of what we do in MI is we use our communication skills to say, well, it's two parts of you. Some part of you wants to be healthy, doesn't want to get HIV. 
And so tell me about that part of you. Again, we're being strategic by saying, I don't want to talk about the party that says bacon cheeseburgers are delicious. Yes, they are, but we ain't going to make any progress talking about that. I'm talking about how sexy you're going to look uh, down there in Delaware at the shore in a couple months if you get on a food plan today, whatever else, right? So I want to hear about the party that wants to be healthy and sexy, not, oh man, I really want to go to Bojangles for lunch and have this or that. So I, I, I got to understand there are competing desires. I got to work on believing in it, knowing what to do and how to do it. Again, I don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater. There are some people that aren't sure what they can do, how to do it. A number of you said, I need new skills. And so it's why when we're working with consumers and they say, yeah, I'd like to avoid HIV. I'd like that. Talk about that medication you talked about. Um, the, the idea is that, well, let's really roll up our sleeves and talk about how people do that. This last bullet, I think we could spend the whole day on, probably a two-day workshop. I may, my inner voice may say, I can't do that thing. One of the things we'll talk about in later training, for those of you who are going to be part of the later training, is um, does my inner voice, do I lack confidence to do that thing that I, does my inner voice say, I can't do that? Uh, again, in, in my terms, we say two things have to be there to be ready. I got to know, I, I got to believe I got a problem. Problem has to be important. And I have to have a high level of confidence I can do something about it. Both of those need to be in place before I'm able to make a change in my sexual behavior, change my substance use behavior, change my, my needle using behavior. And so if that second one is not there, I'm saying, I don't think, you know, all my friends are using dope the way I use dope or I've had sex this way my whole life, or since I've been a grown person, I don't think I can change, or I'm a drug dependent and I, I do these things for money or sex or whatever complicated reasons people may tell us, I can't do that thing you're asking me to do. Comments, questions. I'm in the home stretch. Let me see where we are. I got about 10 minutes. Two of you like it. Two of you like it. 79 of you think it's terrible. That's all right, I'll take it. Two saying it's good. 79 saying, when is the torture over? You got about 10 minutes. Those of you, anyway, I'm teasing. I mean, the whole other questions, any comment or questions? You guys are doing great. I know it's harder. I love being in a classroom. I miss being in a classroom with some donuts and real life people. Are there any questions about what I've done? Like I said, I know I'm going quick. Well, I'm trying to keep everybody engaged. Thank you. That's a nice comment. All right. Um, Thanks for, for that. Okay, good. Meredith, I'm glad it works for you. Erlene, I'm glad it's helpful to you. And again, people can stay on for the other training. Also, there's books and websites, so this is not your only chance. This training series will not be your only chance, but I hope that people say, well, maybe there's something in this for me. So uh, the, the principles of MI, um, yeah, somebody says personal and professional use. I've had people that I've trained say, you know, I used that with my kid. It was really helpful. So uh, I, if you can use it in your personal life, why not? I think uh, what I don't have is a class called How to Make Your Spouse Do the Right Thing. Believe you me, if I had a, if I had a, a course on how to, how to shape your spouse up, I'd be, I'd be sitting by the pool and Boca Raton. I wouldn't still be humping down here in my basement. So anyway, so how am I as done? Let me do these last few slides and get you all back to work. One of the things that's important is we avoid arguing for change. One of the things that's, that's important here is that tug of war. They, they call it the writing reflex. I'm going to tell you what you have to do. The one I always use is, is the, uh, the, the, I got a DUI, and you think I'm an alcoholic, and I think the sheriff was just out to get me. You ever have that one? No, it was, I wasn't drunk. That sheriff was just a sitting there waiting for me. And you go, well, you were drunk, you know, and you get in that tug of war, you're probably an alcoholic. I ain't no alcoholic, that damn sure, darn sure, we're just a sitting there. And, and so you're in that. So we can't ever win by that, that sort of, I'm going to prove I'm right. This is, a, this is a hard road for people that need to be right and tell people what to do. Um, the, the second bullet is understanding what motivates your consumers. Again, what motivates me is likely different than what motivates you. I asked you to think about why you, why we were stuck making a change. For many of us, we're stuck because the pieces haven't come together, the benefits, the cost, the new skills, the social support, all that, that needs to happen. Understanding my goals and why it's inconsistent 
with me, if we think about why you did make a successful goal, for a lot of us, it was our internal motivation shifted and we either wanted the benefits of doing the healthy thing or we wanted to avoid the consequences. I said earlier, I was a non-smoker. My relationship to cigarettes changed once my best friend had uh, her first child and, and I was gonna be the, the greatest uncle in the world. And I thought, how can I be in this kid's life and, and him see me as a smoker and, and smelling of secondhand smoke? That kid never saw me smoke a cigarette. My, my nephew never saw me smoke a cigarette because I'd been wanting to stop all the reasons, but, but that was the thing that tipped me up where I was like, I'm not gonna be a smoker. So that was my reason to change. People would say, what about the money? And what about the blah, blah, blah? And say, shut up. That wasn't my reason. My reason to change was my, my nephew and, and what kind of uncle I was gonna be. So listen to your patients again. Sometimes I say to people who've had previous training, what do you remember? Often the nugget people take away is, well, I need to listen more and talk less. And I'm like, boom, you learned something good in that class. Listen more, listen to understand sort of their reasons, or their understanding, their perceptions of them. Maybe they need information. Again, like most of us, they're probably not gonna need that information. They're gonna need support, understanding the barriers, internal, external barriers. And the last sort of uh, guiding principle of MI is, is about client-centered counseling. I said, this goes back to early humanistic psychology. We build, I believe people have the answers to their own question. And so deciding what to do about your health, this last quote down there, deciding what to do about your health is up to you. I taught this class, I taught, taught an all day class down in South, South Carolina years ago, probably eight or 10 years ago, but we were in the afternoon, this person got it, the lightning bolt went off, she went, ooh, 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 I get it, I get it. I said, what baby, what? She held her hand up, she said, in MI, we hold up a mirror for our patient and we ask them what they see and what they wanna do about it. I said, baby, take your certificate and go home, you are a graduate of MI, because at the heart of this thing, again, it's not me telling you, what to do. We hold up a mirror with an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion back to our, uh, our definition. And we say, well, you've had multiple STDs in the last six months. And you know, there's some things I can't treat or you've had consequences associated with your injecting or whatever. And you know, what do you see? What do you think about it? And what do you wanna do about it? Ultimately, if we agree that change comes from their perspective. So understanding their readiness is how we evoke their perception. If they're ready, go ahead and do that. If they're not ready, maybe we plant seeds. One of the things that I say early on is it is a success to plant seeds. So often the system or we ourselves say, I won't be successful unless people are absent or good prep people or whatever. That, that in fact, if I plant a seed, I wanna allow there to be ambivalence. I wanna understand the ambivalence, the good things and bad things. Like I said, you are strategic though. You wanna go back here and say, well, some part of you wants to not get further complications of HIV or some part of you is scared of, of hepatitis. And let's talk about that. Some part of you doesn't want another STI. I'm gonna go back again and listen for that reason to change. I wanna understand people's barriers. One of the most compassionate things we could do is say, what makes it hard for you to be healthy? You know, I think, one of the most disrespectful things they do in healthcare is they say, make it sound easy. You know, I talk about my weight. If those of you who, who uh, will, will be with me in future training, I try to not do that. But the reality is I've been overweight my whole adult life. And, and so these doctors that say, well, why don't you just stop? Why don't you make your mind up and lose that weight? You know, if you've ever had a weight problem or, or ever had any kind of, uh, you know, and struggle to change, and someone says, well, why don't you just do that thing and make it sound easy? As I said, we all want to be skinny, non-smoking, non-drinking, something, you know, sexy body, whatever. But can we do those things? Uh, again, uh, the heart of evoking here is eliciting my ideas as your consumer. What, what's realistic to me? And then again, this idea of inviting me to talk about my my hopes and my future. So uh, there'll be discrepancies. Some part of you wants to be healthy and some part of you don't want to give up doing the things that you've been doing, honky-tonking with the people you've been honky-tonking. How to enter into that ambivalence is, is really 
critical. You, you, you said you want to be healthy, but you're not doing the healthy thing. It's important that we approach this and recognize that people are going to feel judged if we're not careful. Why can't you do that thing? Versus, well, tell me about that party that doesn't want to do the healthy, can't do the healthy thing. So I'm curious. Um, I want to understand if it's someone making a choice or they don't have the ability to do it. Again, if I can't resolve that ambivalence, then maybe the goal is too hard. Maybe abstaining from alcohol and drugs is not the goal. Maybe cutting back is a realistic goal. Maybe just not injecting or not injecting. Uh, last, last poll, and then we are wrapping up. Uh, patients who are stuck. Uh, and again, back to these people who know what they're supposed to do. Uh, are they stuck? I used the term importance and confidence a minute ago. Do people get stuck because they don't understand how important the change is and they need more facts, or do they get stuck because their internal consequence, confidence, is low and they need help with social support and overcoming the barriers? Think about people who are stuck. Again, that's who we're going to be talking about uh, when we talk about MI. Where are your patients stuck? What do they need from us? They don't, they don't have the facts. They need more facts. They don't have the confidence. They need me to help build social support and address barriers. Let's go ahead, click on the radio button. 30 more seconds. And let's publish that. Elena, let's go ahead. I'm recognizing we're out of time. And whoo, Lord have mercy. That's clear. Again, it looks like people don't need more pamphlets. I feel sad. I feel sad for the pamphlet makers who are uh, watching this thing, but what you're saying, 88% of people understand they got a problem, but 88% of the time they know it, but they don't know how to get around it, or they lack social support or understanding with the barriers or any of those things. So, um, so some good open-ended questions, like as you start to move into MI, these are some agenda setting questions. You've got these in your hand. I'm not going to read to grown people, but sort of ways to set the agenda, ways to have MI be a conversation. Uh, these last two slides are good measures of whether you're doing MI, and I think they're a measure of how important it is for you to think about, well, again, whether it's the future training or other training or just monitoring your own practice and making a decision to change, how much of these 10 things do you do? Understand your patient's concern, good listening, partnering versus guiding. Thank you, Effie says, um, what about feeling good with smaller successes? Absolutely. Effie, my beef is, is we don't call ourselves successful or our patients successful until they're the perfect patient. I ain't ever gonna be the perfect patient. And a lot of your most vulnerable folks, if you're waiting for them to be perfect patient, you're gonna wait a long time. So are you negotiating the focus? Uh, are you listening for your patient's reasons to change? How are you doing with change talk? Are you honoring patient choices? Do you ask permission before teaching? Uh, we're, you're gonna, I think in your handouts, let me go ahead and ask, we, oh, there it is. Michael says, yes, we won't email these. Sorry about that, absolutely, you'll get a copy of these. I'm gonna go ahead, since we're almost at time, uh, it, it, you, first of all, for those of you who are only in this conversation, it's been great to see you. You get an hour of CEUs, I hope there's been help, something helpful in this. As I said, if doing a, a series, a training series after this isn't right for you, there are books that are available, you'll see in the resource guide in just a minute, books on MI, websites, tapes to see, you totally are, are able to, to go out and do that. If you are a supervisor and have staff who are gonna be in the training series, you better get ready uh, because you're gonna have some really smart people and they're going to tell you we ain't talking about perfect patients anymore and they're going to tell you we're going to start where the patient is at now and so part of why i want supervisors to be privy if your supervisor is not on here please forward this slide deck and say hey that good looking bald guy said i should share this with you before i do the training please say it that way good looking bald guy said because i'm inviting the system to be more patient use these principles not be finger wagging less directive um, for those of you who are going to be in the skill building, and Elaine is going to do the thing, um, uh, give you the, the dates and stuff. So just to, to begin to start listen differently, sort of, sure, is this patient ready? Why are they stuck? Just turn your ears on. Again, get out of teaching 
and whatever else and start to. Um, for those of you who want to do the um, skill building series, I want people on webcam with your full self and ready to do the thing. Uh, uh, again, this should be a small group thing where I'd come to DC. Periodically, we can't do that because of the current situation. So uh, we're going to do an intro webinar. I'm going to do four follow-up sessions. Again, here's some skills. Go out and practice two weeks later. Come back and do whatever else. Then we're going to do graduation at the end. Where are my citations at? There they are. The citations for this Dr. Miller's first paper, uh, uh, the original book, the third edition book, um, and, and the, the diabetes study. Um, I think it's time. Oh, here's some more resources. More resources for you. More books that are helpful. Um, group work. Shoot, I don't have, there's, there's another book I should have had up here. If you work with adolescents, there's a book called Motivational Interviewing and Adolescents, Sylvie Nara King. But if you just Google on one of the book selling sites, Motivational Interviewing with Adolescents, there's a, a whole book on from a variety of researchers that give you tips on working. Everything is on motivationalinterviewing.org. Oh, Karen, I'm glad this was helpful. Great. Uh, and boom, now you're going to talk, Elena. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll be brief, but um, this thank you emailer coming out today, I'll send the slides um, that Jim has prepared. This is a wonderful presentation, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll also share the registration for um, the upcoming four-part series. These are the dates for your notes, um, but we'll look at those uh, registrations to determine the types of credit we're going to get it accredited for, so make sure that you write your credentials in with your name. Um, and thank you so much for attending. We'll be in touch. Have a good one. Bye.